So, so do, I, do I have to listen to what she said? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll have to step back because I talk loud anyway. <laughs> Please just delete. Okay. Um, I'm Belinda Arthurs. I'm with the City of West Sacramento. I uh, work in the water uh, programs. Uh, water conservation is one of my uh, jobs. And we have in our uh, municipal codes the water conservation restrictions. Uh, technically, at this point, I, I think most of the city is aware of this, but the City of West Sacramento right at this point is not considered in a drought, although the whole state's in a drought, we have not had restrictions on our water intake yet to the plant. That is, the re that is where the measure of the drought comes in for the water treatment plant. But that does not mean that we don't want people to not waste water in uh, the, the businesses and in their residences by overwatering and flooding the gutters and hosing down sidewalks and hardscapes. So. Um, we do have the municipal codes, and uh, we can enforce those at such time as we will go to a next stage in our drought, which will be coming at the, the rate we're going with water. Um, also, we have the water meter installation that is occurring right now for the city, and uh, that will be completed and uh, running at, in 2013. We are installing approximately 1,000 this last summer, and uh, we're moving forward with that. And Derek, help me with Derek's last name. Is it Goodwin? <laughs> is it Goodwin? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Derek Goodwin is uh, oversees that. Uh, we work in conjunction with them uh, in, in the uh, water metering program. That will help people to conserve. <laughs> but at this point, something there is no uh, incentive to conserve when you don't uh, sometimes hit the pocketbook, unfortunately. And I want to go forward with this. I'm very thrilled that Dina Kirtley from uh, Parks and Rec, our urban forester, has uh, brought Roberta Walker in. And I'll let you go with this from here, Dina. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. Um, uh, I've been eagerly anticipating this day arriving for, what, three weeks now? Um, I first met Roberta at a PAPA, that's a pesticide seminar in Sacramento about two months ago. And uh, they typically have fairly mundane programs and it's very repetitive. You know, the, the idea is to qualify for your, your CEUs. But I was very refreshed when uh, Roberta Walker was there doing a presentation on drought tolerant landscapes. And I was just uh, so enthusiastic about it that I thought it would benefit the city of West Sacramento uh, staff but we're also recording it so that we can put it on our website and residents of West Sacramento can enjoy the information she's going to offer also. So today, the tree program and the environmental program division, which Belinda's part of, have invited Roberta Walker to do, to do a presentation on the topic of drought tolerant landscapes. Um, she's been a landscape designer working in the Sacramento area for many years. She's done over 700 uh, gardens. She's been featured twice in Sunset Magazine uh, and has filmed four segments for HGTV's Gardening by the Yard, which I haven't personally seen, but I'd be very interested to see. Uh, she's developed and designed methods in a large plant palette for creating drought tolerant landscaping uh, and making the transformation from lawns to no lawns a very smooth process, which is tricky for a lot of people. Um, Focus is low maintenance, low water, and a beautiful habitat for local insects, birds, and butterflies. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Roberta Walker. Thank you. OK, well, you already know who I am. And I'll just say that um, doing landscape design, as I've been doing for the last 12 or so years, um, drought tolerant landscaping wasn't at the forefront when I started. But I did a lot of landscapes like that because it was just a more beautiful way to landscape with texture and color. And across the board, my clients have all asked for low maintenance. So even without water issues, not having a lawn is lower maintenance. I, I run into very few people who tell me that they love to spend their weekends mowing. So 
anyway. Um, so my plant palette has, de has developed over the years. I went to England to study some of the gardens there, and while it was the top of the best gardens, they're beautiful, everything in its place, we don't garden like that. We like everything beautiful, but very little maintenance because we have busy lives and we don't want to spend that much time in the garden. So the plant palette that I've developed kind of addresses that. A lot of the color that I bring in, and I'm all about color, is color that comes inherently from the plant, the shrub. A lot of people make the mistake of wanting an English garden and they plant tons of perennials and color flowers, and then in the winter, everything's dead. So I'm going to show you how to how to layer and bring in uh, topography and flow to create your drought tolerant landscape. And pictures say more than a thousand words, although I'm going to say at least a thousand words too, but you'll have them both. So we're going to dim the lights and I'll be talking throughout and then at the very end if you have questions, go ahead and ask. Okay. Most of my clients have normal homes. These are not homes in architectural digest. These are homes that we all own, and the transformation is relatively easy, and the cost depends on how, you know, what elements you want. This is my house. That was my house. And I have 50 feet of grass from the front door to the street with an old dying Modesto ash out front. And, um, at least three different kinds of weeds and grass in there. And so I took everything out and, um, okay, there we go, and created something different. Now, um, let me see if I can go back. Okay, again, there's all grass, and now there isn't grass. It was all flat before, but in the beginning, in the foreground, the very left, you see that tree? That had to come out, like most of them, they only have a 55-year life, the Modesto ash. And so what it left, even though we ground the stump, it, it leaves a lot of roots. So instead of fighting with the roots, which you can, you could pickaxe them, consider creating a mound and let it decompose slowly. Okay, so I'm, I'm always for working with the landscape instead of fighting what's there. And we'll talk about that, I'll talk about that with um, drainage. On the left, where that flagstone is, that's flagstone and decomposed granite, which allows water to percolate into the soil instead of just run off into the street. It also serves as a great way to pull my trash out because it was just grass before. And this house was 55 years old, and even though they had three times the size cars back then, we have half the size of a driveway, so that facilitated the trash. Oop, okay, going the wrong way. Um, this is what Sunset did. This is the very front entry. Now, so many homes have a driveway and then a sharp bend of a sidewalk and then another sharp bend up to your front door. But very few have pathways from the street up to your front door. And that's one way to start creating on this flat pallet, if you have, some flow. So that path actually creates a flow and it sort of delineates right side from left side, instead of just poking things helter-skelter, which I could have, but I had so much space that I wanted to leave the middle open and then mound the sides so it's inviting and yet not too busy. This is some of the planting. Now, there's a preconception that drought tolerant has to do with cactus and uh, pumice stone, lava rock. That's one way if you like that, <laughs> but there are other ways. And by simply transforming your overhead sprays into a drip irrigation system, you're going to save a lot of water. So everything I do now is on drip. There's another view. So it looks like an English garden, but these are plants that, that, that tolerate the heat. 112 plus degrees and then down to 24 degrees sometimes in the winter. At the end, I'm going to pass out um, some of my favorite drought tolerant plants. It's, it's certainly not all the plants that are available, but they're the ones that work. When I design a garden, everything has to work. So I usually don't use things that are exotic and that the label says they're going to work. I have to know that they're going to work. Okay, now my clients have all made sure that I don't let them know who they are for their befores. <laughs> and <laughs> because they just don't want to be associated. But anyway, this, this, this particular client was a first time home buyer and she bought the house like this. And she is not a gardener, she wanted something easy to manage, low water, and um, that's what I created. 
Those plants, this is not quite a year of growth for these plants. So perennials grow very quickly, and I generally start with one gallons, and if they're shrubs I'll, I'll, that are slower growing, I'll start with five gallon. Those are basalt columns that are drilled. So that's a water feature, it's not on in this picture, but a great way to have a water feature is to have the basin below grade. So under those rocks is a screen with the basin with the pump. That way, and then I just run a drip line in. So every time the irrigation comes on, the basin's being filled to, to take care of any evaporation that happened. But you don't have algae. You don't have standing water with mosquitoes. It's a great way to have a fountain. You know, those Italian fountains, they dry out really quickly. They're lovely. And if they dry out and it's running, your pump is burned out. So I, I love to do. And this, the basalt can be substituted for urns. Any type of water feature that you want to have, it's the same concept with the below grade. Uh, basin. Now this is, for all intents and purposes, a normal backyard. This particular landscape coming up is going to be in February's edition of Sacramento Magazine. So the first thing that I want you to notice is that's a koi pond. And you can imagine every time you mow the grass, the grass is in the koi pond. It has to be skimmed out because that's going to end up in the filter. The other thing is there's not much hardscape there. This is, like I said, Gold River, so it probably went in 15 to 18 years ago where uh, I guess there wasn't that much need for dining outside. <laughs> we've, we've got more need now. So I got rid of all the grass because they didn't use it. They didn't play croquet, volleyball, nothing. Okay, there's the koi pond now. I did not change the shape of the koi pond, but we did, what we did is took out the grass and we cut stone in. So all through this we used flagstone and created an outdoor fireplace and um, barbecue. This is a drought tolerant landscape. It's one of your more expensive ones, but you're gonna see both, okay? So everything's available. I use cobble a lot. River cobble in River City here is exp inexpensive, <laughs> okay? It's about $28 per yard. And it's a great feature, and you'll notice that there's a drain there. So it's a great way of creating drains. Aside of just being a, a, an accent through the garden, it's a great way to divert water. And there's the view. So remember when we started, there was grass, a little patio. Now the whole area has become sort of an outdoor room. There's the cat. That's Romeo. May Romeo rest in peace. He's not here with us anymore, so <laughs> he's immortalized in my PowerPoint presentation. Speaking of cats, I was hired to design this landscape for the five cats that live here. There's also adults that paid for it, but the cats live out here. And um, you can see the cat fencing around the edges. That's to keep the cats in. But clearly, they did not like this landscape. There's just nothing going on. So again, it's flat. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create some topography. OK, there's two of the cats. And there are some mounds. This landscape, those are one gowns, within a year look like this. OK? Behind that basalt fountain is a clumping bamboo. Clumping bamboo is fairly drought tolerant. I just put two drip lines on it. Nothing grows faster than bamboo. Clumping is not running. There are two different types. There's clumping, running. Your, your running bamboo is going to need a ditch at least 30 inches deep of concrete or metal flashing to keep it in. Clumping will clump to about five feet around. It'll be at its grown height in three years. It's evergreen. It moves with the breeze. The birds love it. And I've seen so many people try to create some kind of screening because they're in um, production homes by putting in Italian cypress, which honestly belong in Tuscany, OK, at 70 feet high, or redwoods that eventually have a base of 20 to 30 feet. OK, so consider the clumping bamboo. Again, there's cobble, gazanias. And uh, now this property is the first straw, straw bale house that was built in Sacramento. And um, it's off Greenback. And I'd been interested in straw bale, so I'd kind of been hanging around the project. And uh, the man that built that, Al Flanders, he's in his 70s. He was in his 70s then. He's close to 80 now. Um, finally said, uh, well, what do you do? He said, well, I'm a landscape designer. Well, I, I want a xeriscape. So this is considered a xeriscape, which is different from drought tolerant. A xeriscape is a landscape where the plants um, 
someone trying to get in over there, where the plants, once they're established, exist with no irrigation. They live off whatever water is available, but they do need a year's worth of watering to be established, so that's, um, that's important. But there's a whole, there are actually many books written on xeriscape plants, and they, they do work. I, I did this landscape, and I thought, I don't want to see it again because it's going to be dead, and lo and behold, it was alive. It's really alive. So this in the foreground is ice plant. The, the type is Delosperma. It's on this list here. And also, a lot of people have Mediterranean-style homes, and they want bougainvillea. Well, you know, bougainvillea is going to die in the cold. But this has the same vibrant color and can give you that same Mediterranean look. So it's just an alternative. And there's the front. OK. A landscape where there's a lot of shade. And this is fair oak, so everything is on a hill. So I'm looking down from their, their deck. And you can see there's not much use space here in, until I redo it. That's the first picture we looked at looking towards the pool. That's what it looks like now. The grass is gone. I've done cobble and formiums, and these plants that I've used here, because it's shade, are not necessarily drought-tolerant plants, but they all went onto a drip system instead of sprays. There's no evaporation, there's no runoff, and the plants degrade. And there's another picture. I'm, I'm at the very bottom now. That's scotch moss. Again, I put mounds, boulders, and now I'm looking down. That, that cobble stream actually is drainage, so the drains run right through there and then under the concrete. OK, this is a corner property in, in, uh, by the river. So this is going to be a drought-tolerant landscape, and it has to be deer resistant. So you know, everything gets a little more challenging. <clears throat> Low water, uh, deer. So now my plant palette has come even tighter. The turkeys, I can't do anything about. They just lay and smash everything. But, it's just the way it is. So the courtyard there, it's actually it was a courtyard. There was a drainage problem. So we tore up all the concrete and then made that a regular courtyard. Now, her choice of using flagstone versus other materials is a choice. It's the most expensive choice. The, the next step down would be concrete. The next step down with that, from that would be decomposed granite or pea gravel. OK, so patios don't always have to be a hardscape. And there's also pavers, too, the basilite pavers and different types of pavers, which are more permeable in the cracks because they're set in decomposed granite. So not everything has to be, you know, flagstone. And um, this is a very large property. So again, what needs to happen is there needs to be paths and flow. Because with this size of a yard, you're looking at hundreds of plants in the first place. But then we also, you always want to think of how to get from point A to point B. You don't want things just placed everywhere. There's, there's always a flow. And if there isn't, you create it. So that pathway is one of them. There's another pathway that's coming down to her vegetable garden, which is here, which has a seven-foot fence to keep the deer out. <laughs> so, and this is her front yard. So it's very doable to have a sustainable landscape where you could eat a lot of your plants and still have it look attractive for the front of your yard. Now, in this instance, you can see that little bit of a swale there. They had a major water problem here. And um, I just want to illustrate the back door. You see, you walk out, and you're in dirt. So having a patio is a good thing. <laughs> Not only for a place to sit, but also to keep the water away from the house. Always, always keep the water away from the house. That's where your major damage is going to happen, not to mention you know, mold. And so there's the patio. Now, we use pea gravel and flagstone. This is a quarter acre. We just, we just did the, um, the part close to the house. But the cobble now is covering a six-inch rigid PVC drain. That's how much water. So that, under that is a drain. And because it's mainly cobble and pea gravel, there's not a lot of dirt and silt that's going to get into the drain and clog it up. And there it is, a little more grown out. And there. So from an area they didn't even go back in, 
now it's somewhere where they spend a lot of time in, which is what happens in most cases when you when you take make the effort not just for water converse, conservation, but when you make the effort to transform your yard into something that you just look out of a window now and then to a space you actually use, you increase your square footage, not to mention your joy. This is in downtown, and they are getting ready to retire, and they wanted somewhere to sit and bird watch. And you could see all those old camellias, the old juniper, they're old and had to go. This is the pride and joy of my client's husband, the workshop. Talk about a sore thumb. Okay, so you can have structures like this, but I put an arbor around it so it fits in. It could look like a nice little cottage, like that. And that's ground cover time around the fountain. That's edible, and it's drought tolerant. And now I'm sitting in front of the, in front of the shed, which used to be a blazing hot place with the concrete and the reflected heat against the shed, the walls. Now it's a little um, retreat. And even though this yard is very small, there's a pathway, because pathways can create that mystery of going somewhere. Very often, our yards are a rectangle or a square or even pie shape. And if you can see all the corners, there's no mystery. So by putting in some mounds, some pathways, and, and start, you know, in um, the Japanese gardens, the way that they create depths is they'll put some larger shrubs and trees up front and the smaller ones in back. That gives you the idea of having more distance than you actually have in your yard. So there's a lot of tricks, and there's really no limit to the possibilities of what you can create. This is a perfect before and after. I'll just go right there. Okay. This is also a very inexpensive transformation. All right, so, oh, wait, let me go back there. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little mixed up here. Back. Okay, there. A little out of there, okay. So from the flat grass, see it's absolutely flat, by the way, if you have Bermuda grass in your grass, if you don't kill it with poison, and I'm an organic gardener, you will always have Bermuda grass, okay? I hate to say it. I talked to one organic gardener and said, oh yeah, you could just boil salt water and pour it over. <laughs> you know, if you have any kind of space boiling salt water, you kill everything, actually. So I, um, I recommend that you treat everything first because remember, when you put in a drought tolerant landscaping, you're going to have space between the plants. Only the plants are going to get watered, but in the spring, you have rain in the winter, and any seeds that were in there are going to germinate. So, again, you want to do things once and do it right. It's just not worth the time or money to um, skip any phase. So, um, so, there we go again. And I added a mound, some boulders. That's probably a yard and a half of cobble. So you're looking at about $35, $40 worth of cobble and probably about $200 worth of plants. Then there's bark. And of course, there's the labor. So if this is something that you're doing yourself, it's, it's very doable. And now we get to the backyard. Again, no disclosure of who this is. <laughs> She's so embarrassed. But she bought the house like this. So again, I'm going to show you how depth, how, how little tricks. You see, the right corners, the whole bottom yard is flat. But by creating a mound in the right corner, that cobble stream that really just goes from one end to the other, it's not like a stream running through a forest, but the illusion is there. And so the illusion of depth is here. And this, this is a, an example where she's used decomposed granite as the patio. It's much less expensive than concrete. And those um, shade sails are canvas shade sails. They come in triangles, 11 feet, or they come in squares. Now, there's the high-tech type that they have at Cal Expo. But these particular shade sails we bought online, they were $88 a piece. And they could be taken down in the winter when you need the light. So you don't have to spend thousands on an overhang. And don't even consider using wood anymore for overhangs. I just replaced so many rotted ones, and right now they're going for around $28 per square foot to build. The non-wood cannot be used for overhangs because there's recycled plastic, and so you always need you know, a, a, a wood beam as your um, vertical supports. So this is a great alternative, and the non-wood overhangs are, are good also. 
This property is in Roseville, and this property has a lot of oaks. Now, there's only certain plants that should be planted under oaks because oaks have a, a deep tap root. They're not supposed to have grass underneath them. The grass is supposed to be out, pushed out to the drip line of the tree, which in this instance, it's not. Here's the side. Okay. Um, I don't know if you could see it back there. Do you see the garage door back there? That's one of those garage doors where you, you go in the front and the back door opens. Well, there's really nowhere you can go with that garage door except down the stairs and into the pool. So my client wanted us to hide, wanted me to hide the garage door. And also notice the blue tile on the pool. The whole pool is going to get redone. There's the door. No more garage door. I didn't get rid of it. I just put a screen in front of it. I didn't get rid of the concrete of the steps. I faced it with flagstone. And the blue tile's gone. Everything is stone. It's a much more natural look. And there are the oaks and an outdoor cook space, which that was the only place it could go, again, because the restrictions with the oaks. Now, this is the actual the oak park-like on the side. Everything planted under those oaks are, are plants that are designated for that. And then if you have Sunset Western Garden, there's a whole section of under oaks. There's, there's problem areas. So under oaks is one, dry areas, shady areas. And again, the cobble stream, there's drainage under there. Here's a very shady lawn that the lawn will never look good because that 50-year-old elm. And the roots are throughout the whole, you can see the roots. So even trying to mow around that, you're going to keep mowing over the roots. It's just not good for the tree. Another view. Okay. Instead of fighting with the roots, I'm simply putting cobble on them. In the foreground, I could build the soil up a little bit, and I used a ground cover called Pachysandra. That's a shady ground cover that's meant for planting under trees because it's very shallow rooted. There it is again. It's just it's clean and it's nice. When the leaves come down, you blow them out. But no more mowing. And a path. For years, they parked in their driveway, walked down along the sidewalk up to their front door. For years. How about a pathway? Hey. What a novel idea. And that's just set in decomposed granite. OK. Before, after. Again, she's not a gardener. Most 80% of what I design into a landscape is evergreen versus deciduous, which means that all year it'll look nice. Then the perennials. And the, and the deciduous plants and trees will come and go without the whole landscape looking dead. It's really important to balance that. And that's the problem most people run into when they want to create that cottage or English garden look. They put in all perennials instead of any structure. And very often, your structure is the evergreen shrubs. It doesn't have to be walls. But you've got to have the evergreen there to balance. Not just evergreen, but that silver artemisia, that's, that looks like that all the time. Just some of the grasses will go dormant. Again, that cobble stream, no drainage. It's just simply there for flow. And these plants, Cerastium in the foreground and Gaillardia, fire wheel daisy, those are considered xeriscape plants. So once they're established, no water. This is one of my favorite landscapes. I mean, look at, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> this is. Um, considered a zero lot line. So this wall on the left is actually their neighbor's house. So I can't plant anything on the wall. Also, I have 16 feet from the house to the wall, and this is their dining area. And um, so I, I, there's just no way I can go out any further to create more. But what I can do is I can go lengthwise, which I have. This is the very back where there was just grass. See back there? mound in color, and in the foreground, I built a wall. It was in sunset. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I sacrificed three feet of my 16 feet, 16 foot wet, uh, 
width. Behind that, I did clumping bamboo, and that's a sheer descent waterfall, and it's pouring into, again, a below-grade basin. Same concept as the basalt. Okay, these are not difficult. The sheer descent is a flange that you could buy at a pool supply store. What happens is there's a tube that goes into the back, and when it plugs in, the water gets distributed evenly. They even have them now with LED lights underneath, so you can create something really nice. And, um, yeah, so, you know, this... It's not, it's, it's, it looks expensive. It doesn't have to be. That fire pit, they're in an area where they don't have to do it on gas. But, um, so I've lengthened the whole area of sitting with the sitting wall. And um, so from a, you know, a landscape that, let me go back there. Where are we? Okay, that. To, to create something that's comfortable, shady, inviting, it's the worth of their house has gone up, and, and not just that, the, their time, how they spend their time in their home, and it's worth everything. This is, this is one of the projects I did for Gardening by the Yard, the HGTV show, and um, this is down in downtown Sacramento, and that sycamore is probably 40 years old. There's roots all through there and very little space between one driveway and the next house. And the grass will never look good, and it's superfluous anyway to have grass there. And we cannot dig in this area. It's all roots. And so instead, we um, did something a little artsy. So we ran drip lines up through these pots. Now, the pots we anchored with rebar, because unfortunately, anything that looks good, other people think it looks good too. And is you know just just picking it up, so they cannot pick these up. Okay, if your hole is big enough in the bottom of the pot, you could take the dog leash. Um, there's these you know these metal dog supports, but we used rebar in here, and so up through the hole also went the drip lines. So when you have pots, you don't have to have the drip lines flopping over the top of the pot. Consider before you plant of bringing the hose up putting the soil in, planting the plant, cutting off the top of the drip line, putting on the emitter. Every time your system comes on, your plants get watered. You can go out of town, and you don't have to come back to dead plants. That's basically what we did here. So it's a, it was a problem to a solution. A uh, solution to a problem, sorry. <laughs> OK. These people had been there for 14 years, barely used the back. How do you like that? That's a wood deck. Okay, rotting, um, splinters. What do you do? You, there's not even enough room there. I mean, what do you do? You sit in a long file, you know, like, anyway. I can go on and on about different de design ideas that, that happen. Maybe everyone was drinking too many martinis back in the 60s, you know, and they thought, oh, we'll have this long, you know, six-foot path there. Well, concrete is a much better and less expensive alternative than wood decks. And very often, people that consider wood decks are not considering that when they walk out of their house, they're going to be elevated. So if you want some privacy, you're already standing at least six inches higher than before because they need pilings underneath the wood deck. Very often, you want to be in your yard and you want to feel alone and screened in. So it's good to be at ground level. Now, um, they wanted to try their hand at gardening. Now, these are recycled wood products, and you could do that in something small. So those beds um, are timber tech, and then there's decomposed granite around the base, and within a year, it looked like that. And on the right is moss rock, head-sized moss rocks, so that there was old, an old rotting wood retaining wall, and instead we put in what's called a dry stack moss rock wall. Dry stack means that it's slightly tilted, so you don't need mortar, but you've got to stay within two feet height. You know, any higher, you're going to need support. But again, it's not expensive. People are afraid of the cost of uh, rock, but you're mainly looking at labor, not the actual cost, because moss rock will go from anywhere from 80 to $125 per ton. This yard, um, very small yard, Curtis Park, he wanted an Asian theme. Now, generally, I'm considered the recycle queen. I don't like to get rid of anything, but if there's something that's in the way of using the space the way it can be used, then I'll get rid of it. And we all know that a Japanese na maple is not a native. You know, it wasn't here at the beginning. So anyway, there are two other ones that are in better condition. So I took this out. 
Did I go the right direction? No. Gosh, I just can't get it straight here. Okay, there we go. To put in a deck. So, tree, no tree. That deck is an Ipe deck. That's a rainforest wood. Ipe um, is, is one of the varieties. There's Gorapa, all different kind of exotic woods, but they're very, very dip, very hard wood. They're one by six. They don't come in two inch, and they have to be pre-drilled. That's how hard they are, but they do have a 25-year life warranty, and um, you have to put them in with stainless steel screws and, and uh, much closer support underneath. But if you do want a natural deck, you can consider that as a renewable resource. They grow pretty quickly. Am I going the right way? No. Nope. Okay. Cobble. I mix black Mexican pebbles and an Asian stone that's turquoise. I buy all my pebbles and cobble at Cascade Rock here. Your black Mexican pebbles are $16 a bag. The Asian stones are a little bit more, but you can create art in your yard just by putting a little cobble stream. One of, I brought two DVDs that I've uh, written, produced, and starred in, and no, I did not get an Academy Award for them. But what I do do is show you how to very easily create these vignettes in your yard. The cobble stream is just the cobble stream, but it basically it's the same concept. And I had an artist create the koi fish. So, so y even if you don't want to transform your whole yard, you could transform bits of it and make it sort of come together. And there it is. So w what was a scrubby little yard now is a, a really beautiful, peaceful place. And like I said, he wanted it sort of an Asian theme. So we built that because the neighbor is right across the, the driveway. And there were two more liquid ambers on that lot. I hope nobody goes out and buys liquid ambers and plants in your front yard. <laughs> or your backyard. If you have acreage, fine. But liquid ambers are known to, to take up concrete and even the foundation of your house. Not to mention the little spiky balls that fall. They have beautiful fall color, and that's, that's the beauty of them, but they're a mess. So when those went, they decided to get rid of the grass. And this just went in two months ago, and there's the difference. So you're not even seeing the full potential of what this landscape is, but even the transformation there's color, there's texture, there's, there's a little flow. And instead of using bark, they used crushed uh, rock, with like a pumice. So at Hasty's, that's another alternative. When you use bark, which you want to use something because you're going to cover your drip lines, bark will eventually decompose, and you have to replace it. Now, I plant sort of full, but this is not such a full planting, so eventually you're going to have space in between. Consider, now there's weed fabric under here, consider using a crushed rock. It looks like bark. You could still blow leaves off of it, but it's not going to decompose, not going to go away. Here is a mess. <laughs> no other word for it. But by using moss rock, I could clean that up. Okay, so that's, I, I cleaned it up with the moss rock. Again, dry stacked. It's just slightly tilting in and then planted. Um, now, this house is facing due west. So she gets a lot of heat. This woman is in her late 70s, and I guess she, she had a consultation with me 10 years ago and was kind of deciding what she wanted to do. So <laughs> 10 years later, we got down to business. <laughs> and there it is. It was just planted. So again, um, you can kind of see what's coming. On, on the posts are climbing roses. So eventually, it's going to look like a really charming cottage with the roses, the cobble stream, and those are drought-tolerant plants. And she used to go out and mow every weekend. She doesn't do that anymore. This is a lovely remodel with a flat, basic yard. And um, I'm going to take the grass out, but I want you to notice that roof line. I've taken that roof line, and um, I've created a wall on the left. Do you see the wall there on the mound? That little, um, here we go, right here. This wall, if I was to flip it forward, matches the roof line. And the only other slate, which this is faced with, is on these columns. So I liked the, um, there's another picture. I liked the look of the slate, and I wanted to, to bring it in a little bit more. So let me, let me just, oh, I'm sorry. I can't get my roller. <laughs> OK. That's, that's the dog who's doing the punch list at the end. 
I must make sure I, I got everything okay. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back here. Um, okay. You see, the only slate is on those posts. And it's a really nice feature. So by adding it onto the wall, I could pull the architecture into the yard. By adding mounds, I could, I could use that topography to play off, off the architecture also. There we go. I gave that dog a blue ribbon. <laughs> he likes my landscape. Actually, the neighbors came out and said, well, wh where are the dog, you know, where are the dogs going to go? And I said, well, I got your lawn. <laughs> I was just playing. Normally, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very nice. Okay. <laughs> So this, this piece of grass um, is, the, is the basis of my DVD, which is here. I have my DVDs for sale here. Online, they're, they're on my website, they're $5 more. But not everybody can or does want to work with a landscape designer. I have so many people that want to do it themselves, plus you save a lot of money. But the problem is, when you start with your landscape, you don't know where to start. This DVD takes you from that to measuring that and then translating that into a scale drawing. So a scale drawing is basically creating a bird's eye view of your yard that matches exactly for every inch to every four feet or every eight feet of your yard, which means that when you figure out a little design, you'll know what to order in materials. You'll know that you need maybe a yard of cobble. You know you'll need 30 plants versus 10 plants because it'll all be laid out for you. There's the after. That is one yard of cobble. So you're looking at about $28 right there. The moss rock probably cost another $40, and the plants were probably about, I don't know, $250, $300, because we, we put a shade tree in there too. So what was this patch of grass that really didn't serve any purpose? It had Bermuda, so you know Bermuda goes dormant you know, anytime we go below 70 degrees, so it goes brown for the winter, and nobody used it. This now, the water percolates into the soil, you know, there's not a lot of runoff. Everything here is um, on a drip system, and it's just a prettier way, you know, for the landscape. That's when we first planted it. Um, you see that little red-hot poker there. I'm going to go back. It's not in bloom right now, but they get huge. Um, so that's the other thing is you might want to pack plants into the space to make it look good now, but you have to take in account that they triple, quadruple, and sometimes even get bigger than that. And you can look at um, a plant label and it'll say, yes, it's good for sun, it's in your zone, and it gets this. But when you actually plant it, it may do something else. And so f over the years that I've been designing, I know what they do. I know how big they get, I know how wide, I know when they bloom, when they don't. And that's the concept that I base my designs on after I figured out the logistics of getting point A to B of putting in a path, creating a flow. So mounds and cobble streams and paths are the way that you're going to start to create a flow before any plants come in. But at the same time, you want to consider where the hottest areas are. Do you need a tree there? You know, you, you, you want to map your yard out so you really tackle the problem areas and then put the pretty fluff on top of it. It's just, like, it's just like building a body. I always tell people, so the first thing that happens is the bone structure, which is your irrigation and drainage. If you start on your yard to do one corner, chances are you're going to tear something up. So, so think in your mind, well, I can only afford to do one corner, but right now I'm simply going to tackle the drainage and irrigation. And I'll get to that corner next. But you have the groundwork throughout the yard, so you don't have to tear it up again. You don't have to dig through it. I don't know how many times... I have dug through my yard and dug right through a drip line. It's a pain. You know, everything stops until you go and get a connector. So my DVD addresses how to, how to create a drought-tolerant landscape. And yes, this is a small area, but it can be stretched to a bigger area. And it comes with the plant list that I've used here, but the sheets that I'll hand out is a more extensive plant list. Also on my web, site, and I have cards up here, it's robertawalker.com. I have a blog at the bottom of the home page, and on the blog is also the drought tolerant list. So I'm all about giving out information. And with the meters and everything coming, it's just so much easier in life to be proactive. Instead of getting hit with these huge bills and how am I going to do this, 
later. So if you even start chipping away at it, and most gardens, the process of gardens, is a work in progress. It doesn't have to be you spend 10 grand, 20 grand right now. Start with what you've got, but do it right. Put in the structure first, your underground structure. Then the good soil, that's the muscle. <laughs> then the skin, that's, those are the plants. And then the bows are the lights. <laughs> so that's the, um, the conclusion of the PowerPoint presentation. And we have a few minutes left, so I'm here for the DVDs, which my drought-tolerant DVD is $20. It's usually $24.95 online, and my Creating a Dry Cobble Stream is $15 today, and I'm also available right now for questions. So if you have any garden questions, if you need to know anything, now's the time. Well, decomposed granite is vibrated in. So it's a decomposed granite is a combination of pumice and clay. And the clay, as it gets wet, compacts. Now, over time, you can have some weeds because um, not that they come up from underneath, but seeds can come on top, and it's permeable. But the only thing with decomposed granite, it's hard surface. I've, that's my whole garden area. I switched from pea gravel to that because it's easier to walk on. The only thing you have to watch is sometimes the pumice will get stuck in your shoes. Yeah, so, but my garden is way at the other end. By the time I've walked to my house, it's gone. But, um, so it holds up fine. It's not mushy at all. <coughs> yeah, well, just put in a border, some kind, of, some kind of border between that and your house to transition, just to, you know, because it will scratch wood floors. Yes? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Um, Roundup is a grass killer. Roundup won't kill trees. So you don't, and, it, and most of the time, it won't kill established shrubs, although you do want to stay away from it. The thing with Bermuda grass is that so often it's entwined in the base, the root system of your plants. But with my yard, I wanted to make sure everything was dead. So not only did I kill it, but I just didn't water for a month. And then afterwards, I retreated it because I knew that I would always have to fight with that Bermuda grass unless I got it all. So again, you know, my conscience said, that's a chemical. But the other part of me said, I'm going to be here for years. If I do it <laughs> in this one space, then overall, you know, I, I could put back into the earth with composting what, you know, the damage I did. But yeah, if you don't get your weeds in the beginning, you're, it's something you'll always fight with. Roundup's an adi it's adequate for Bermuda grass and other grasses. If you have nut grass, you have to get a different product that will treat nut grass because the nut's very deep and the Roundup doesn't kill it. So by going to Capital Nursery or Amy Hardware, they, they could tell you exactly what to use. And then you could, you know, you could just dig it out. But if you, with Bermuda grass, if any roots are left, they'll spawn a whole new generation. Well... Roundup has to be done before the temperature drops below 70 because it goes dormant. So once it's dormant, you won't kill it. So I, um, I'd say if we're in the hot, heat of the summer, a week to two weeks, we'll do it. But right now, um, I don't know, we're getting right at that edge. So you, you could try digging it out and solarizing it over the winter. But, you know, I've done that. And I've, I've pulled up totally white roots that grew green again. <laughs> Yeah, I've tried to come to love it, to find something that was redeemable about Bermuda grass, and I can't. Even if I was falling off a cliff and grabbed it, it would break, you know, it breaks in sections. So anyway, it's like mosquitoes. There's a purpose, but I don't know what it is. Oh, wait, I've got... That's okay. Go ahead. I, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend putting anything under them. I would do an area of decomposed granite just so you can get under it. I, I have vinca under mine because it was there, and it's difficult to get rid of. But I try to pick everything before it falls. But you want to kind of keep it open. And if you have a lot of space and you have fruit trees, you could buy in bulk, by the pound, wild flower seeds. 
You could do a mix of blues or oranges. And that's something nice to, to kind of put in the whole area because all the uh, wildflowers will bloom in the spring and then they'll dry out and then they won't be there. And then when the fruit comes, you know, let's say you've weeded, eated it down to the ground, it's fine. Next year the rain comes, they're back up again. So that's what I would recommend. Dogs. Okay. Um, dogs. <laughs> I love dogs. Let me start by saying that. Um, but dogs often want to help you dig where you've dug. So if you put in a new landscape, they think that they're going to help you by doing a little more digging. So when any new landscape comes in, Dogs should be cordoned off until things get a little more established. I've also found that dogs have their, their, their paths that they map out. And very often, I'll try not to change that. And sometimes I'll make it a decomposed granite path, which I, I did with a landscape where there are show dogs. The dogs like to run back and forth. There was a pointer. So he had to point at the birds. So instead of planting in his space, I put a DG path so he wasn't you know, digging up the plants or running over plants. I just kept, you know, his natural place. But, but it is important to cordon them off in the beginning. And if you're laying grass, too, if the dogs run over the grass, you'll have divots there forever. So anyway, they're, they're kind of a problem. I've seen some dogs completely destroy a new landscape. And I've, in, in the most cases, everything gets nice and established, and the dogs get walked until that happens. Yeah, most plants, most plants will. It's not like a grass. Some of your ornamental grasses might not, um, but, but most shrubs will. You know, it just depends on how saturated. I, <laughs> I had this one client with a dog loved this one particular plant, and that plant got a beating daily. And so it was still alive, but didn't look as good as the others, but it was still alive. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't plant any trees. I don't plant, you know, anything with deep roots in those areas. And um, it's very important to check if your property has easements because we um, did a little courtyard wall down off American River Drive. And 40 or more years ago, there were uh, regulations in place about being within the setback. And so we had to measure exactly. And the woman at the building department said, oh, yeah, they're old. Nobody goes by them. But to change them was $11,000 to get the permit. So you want to make sure that um, if there's an easement, for instance, I'm working on a very large property now. And along the side, she wants fruit trees. And there's an easement there. So what we're doing is putting in big, beautiful pots, planters, all the way down. And the fruit trees will go in there. OK? so. There are ways of dealing with it. You just don't want to put a pool in <laughs> right there or trees. Yes? A little bit. Mounding. Mm -hmm. Mounding and cobble streams. Usually cobble streams make a nice bordered delineation between you and your neighbor. So the first thing you want to do is run an epic board or bender. Epic board is recycled plastic wood composite bender board material comes in one by four or two by four. So you'd run that first, and then you put the cobble in. And then there's this nice transition between grass, cobble, and then the new yard. And now on the other side, you don't want to have cobble on both sides, but the mounding would help and maybe some boulders. But what will happen is um, instead of being this anomaly, something that's just right stuck in the middle, it's going to be something of beauty within the blank, you know, the, the regular landscapes with texture. So it's not going to be an eyesore. It'll be something that draws your eye in. And what I've found is when I do those landscapes, I end up doing all their neighbors, too. <laughs> so your neighbors build it, and they will come. You know, your, your neighbors, you know, would take an example, too. But by using cobble stream and boulders and mounds, that's how you make a nice segue from one to the other. 
Um, yeah, but you have to be careful because they go dormant. So you could use some ornamental grasses, but I would use other grasses that don't go dormant, like the fescue and the carex grasses. Stipa grass, which is a Mexican feather grass, which sort of puts itself everywhere, but it's lovely, makes a beautiful alternative to a lawn. Because a whole area, I use it in drifts, almost like rivers, of the soft grass. You don't mow it, you don't do anything. So there are a lot of nice alternatives, but if you're going to use all ornamental grasses, remember they're going to go dormant in the winter and they need to be cut back and you'll have these little dead clumps of grass. But the fescues, the carex, and the stipa are nice alternatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any grass that uh, goes dormant needs like a butch haircut. And depending on the size of the, the grass, you know, it could be a foot and a half cut. But you just, you just bring it down because, the, and this is the only reason you do it, is next year's growth will grow right up into everything. So you just want to cut the old straw-looking stuff down so when the new growth comes, it's nice and green without woody bits inside. Yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate you taking your lunch time and, and, and sitting in. And if you want any more information, I've got postcards here and I've got the DVDs. Thank you. We've got handouts up here, and uh, this is going to be on the city website also, the video. If you want to tell your friends, maybe they'll enjoy watching it. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>